Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, and click the notification button. Hi everyone! I am Dr. Larissa Gata, a sociologist, forester, and educator. In this video, I will be sharing with you the class presentation of SFFG152, Sociology of Natural Resources, Section T. This is a class presentation, a student activity being conducted in SFFG152 every semester. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the activity responses have been modified to suit the virtual learning setup. Activity responses, or more popularly known as AR, refer to individual and group output-based tasks, which I have personally designed for each topic included in the course content of SFFG 152. If you have any inquiries and comments, kindly use the comment section and the students will be more than willing to respond to them to the best of their abilities. Ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant evening, everyone. I hope you're all jam-packed and ready to take a trip from Hawkins to the Upside Down as we search for new knowledge and discovery in pursuit of finding our friend will buyers. I'm sure for most of us, this past semester has been one for the books. A very challenging yet fulfilling one for many of us we'll never forget. Rat nerds. And I'm pretty sure we felt like we went to the upside down since we discovered a lot during the semester, right? It was scary because of the challenges, but we managed to push through. I do hope we weren't that terrified with all of it, though. That's right, Oven. We are not that deep into the upside down because we have our upside down. In our upside down, we are the mind players, but we don't play people like that how it is in the show. We go deep to our course as we find answers to questions. Which is why, for tonight, we are the mind players of forest sociology. Definitely. And having said that, let's now dive into our own world of Upside Down, as SFFG Section T will be presenting their outputs in the course SFFG 152, or Sociology of Natural Resources, this evening. And with that, allow us to introduce ourselves. I am Venice Camille Mendoza Navarro. And I'm Arvin Catalia. Your host, your host for, for tonight. tonight. I'm wondering what will happen. How are you feeling right now, DK? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm kind of excited. So it's like it is going to be a night full of learning and mystery for all of us. Why do you, what do you think, SFFG 152 Section T? Shall we begin? Yes. Yes. Wow. What a lively response from our audience. Let us truly not delay any further and start this event with the prayer and the singing of the Philippine National Anthem.
Thank you, Tech Team. Before proceeding to the presentations, our class president would like to warmly welcome our fellow scholars, professors, and guests. Ms. President, the screen is yours. Good day to my beloved classmates, our amazing professor, Dr. Larissa Gata, and to everyone who is watching our presentation. Section T's SFFG 152 journey is slowly coming to an end, but I am proud of our journey within the upside down world of sociology and natural resources. As students, we have been actively trying to understand the relationship of societies and natural resources to become effective future foresters. We did this through different chapters. Chapter one involves a stakeholder analysis. Two, two is examining media portrayal of environment and natural resources. Three is population dynamics and resource use. Four is gender and natural resource management. And lastly, natural resource governance. I encourage our viewers to react, ask questions, or maybe also leave a comment of support for your friends. I would like to take this opportunity to also thank our professor, Dr. Gata, for guiding us and helping us fight these monsters of mis- or disinformation. So without further ado, I give the floor back to our lovely hosts, and let's get this show started. Thank you, Ms. Paula Dagsi. We would also like to thank and acknowledge the presence of our SF SFFG professor, Dr. Maria Larissa Lelu P. Gata. We are pleased and honored to be trained by the one and only Dr. Larissa Gata. Thank you very much, Dr. Gata. And before the Demogorgon finds all of us, let us begin the series of presentations. The class will be presenting the stakeholder analysis they have done for two different communities here in the Philippines. In the pursuit of understanding the important problems and issues in their chosen communities, they identify the key actors or stakeholders involved and assess the interests, powers, and impacts of each to the issues and problems observed. So invite your own little group and cozy up like Dustin, Lucas, and Mike as we journey to find the key actors of each group. Good day, we are Group 1 and we will be presenting our Activity Response 5 Stakeholder Analysis. As we know, mangroves are widely recognized to significantly contribute to climate mitigation through reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide and to reducing vulnerability by cushioning the impacts of sea level rise. With this, we conducted a stakeholder analysis on Padre Burgos and Pagbilao Quezon to comprehend the system for managing resources. So for the stakeholder composition, a total of 55 stakeholders were identified, and the majority of these are government organizations who implement, fund, and oversee the project. They also have the steering capacity and institutional support. This is followed by people's organizations and then local communities who share their influence over the project. Next is the business sector. And finally, the academe has a very important role in terms of information and future studies. In general, the interest of the 55 identified stakeholders can be categorized into four reasons. 45% of the stakeholders hold interest in economic development, 33% in environment conservation, preservation, protection, and awareness, 15% in policy formulation and implementation, and 7% for research and development. Among the 55 stakeholders identified, 10 were ranked in accordance with their interest and power in managing the natural resources as well as the livelihood of the communities as they heavily rely on this interest area stated. First, the DENR QERDC, PENRO, CENRO, Quezon Provincial Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Office, Carbon Sink Patrol Group Federation for Forest Protection, Provincial Government of Quezon, LGUs, NGOs, POs, and field technicians. The indicators represent that the highest values are those representing the lowest manifestation in the project. As you can see in the figure, those 
nearest to the center, which is the project, are those that bring the significant influence over the project. This is mainly due to the stakeholders' proximity to project area, especially the local communities, which are the main beneficiaries of the project. In our conclusion, the stakeholders' analysis found effective methods in the selection of persons involved who have stakes and concerns in the area. The local community was identified as the major player. The establishment of people's organization from local communities and partnership with private institutions and government organizations is said to be a strategy to execute the programs. Academe, on the other hand, was for the monitoring and evaluation of the project. The efforts and good relation within the selected states were said to be the key foundation of efficient natural resources management. The 95 billion pesos Pasig River Expressway or PADEX has been a hot subject of debate and is continuously being criticized for its environmental and systematic issues. This infrastructure project is targeted to be developed in the cities of Manila, Mandaluyong, Taguig, Makati, and Pasig with a total of 19.37 kilometers 16 project size. The most affected community is the Barangay Pinagbuhatan in Pasig City with a total population of 151,979. This project aims to achieve promising objectives but as attractive as it may seem, it was argued that the negative impacts of Parex far outweigh the supposed to be benefits of the said infrastructural development. Yakap Philippines stated that Parex would be polluting the road system by causing an increased vehicle volume that brings forth higher concentrations of air, noise, vibration, and light pollution which are detrimental to both human and environment. After identifying the stakeholders, they were analyzed based on the reasons for the decrease and increase of power as well as their impacts. Then they were ranked by scoring them based on seven different parameters, proximity to the site, pre-existing rights, dependency, indigenous knowledge, natural resource linkages, and power deficit. The mean value of their score defines their ranking and influences on the effects of Pyrex to them. From the stakeholder analysis, we identify 50 stakeholders categorically break down into six groups. These are the implementing agencies which facilitates the construction and policy regarding PAREX, communities and businesses that will be affected by PAREX, NGOs that are concerned regarding the effects of PAREX, research and development that will guide and recommend scientific basis for the construction of PAREX, and lastly, government agencies. The stakeholders with the lowest mean value are considered the Parex top stakeholders and were obtained using given criteria. PRCMO, residents of Barangay Pinagbuhatan and Pasig River, ferry services and formal settlers along the Pasig River, MDAPTF, Culture Heritage NGO, DANR, and PRCC, and drivers, seafood restaurant, and small shop owners, RHR Consulting Services, Metro Manila's LGU, Palafox Architecture Group, and LIDA are among the stakeholders. Parks will be able to provide alternate routes, potentially reducing traffic congestion on major highways. However, an elevated freeway along the Pasig River will be detrimental to commuters and residents. It departs from inclusive, people-centered, and environmentally sustainable transportation approaches, providing a false sense of relief through short-term decongestion as increased road demand results in more traffic and a more intense flow of private vehicles. Congratulations to all the groups for a successful stakeholder analysis. Let's give them a well-deserved round of applause. Congratulations, everyone. Before we move on to the next presentation, I would like to ask anyone if Will is communicating with them from the upside down. Well, I hope he does. So be mindful of all your light bulbs and radios out there. And for our viewers, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please do not hesitate to drop it in the comment section below. Our class will be very delighted to entertain and answer any queries you may have. Thank you, everyone, for spending your time with us tonight. We, are really, we really appreciate your presence. And moving on, let us hear the next batch of presentation. Oh, wait, there's another batch of presentations? What a productive semester it's been. Oh, Arvin, where is the lie? 
actually the next batch presents the different groups examination of the portrayal and the representation of the environment and natural resources in media. Seems very relevant to our society. So let's go directly to the presentations. The poster we have chosen is the LBC Saan Man sa Pilipinas, pwede na yun. The stereotype portrayed is the expectation of the OFWs to perform unskilled labor or be involved in low-wage occupations. Its relation to the environment is that they are trying to minimize the energy and waste through their actions in terms of transportation. The article chosen is entitled, BBM Government Needs to Define Energy Mix Plan ERC by Daily Tribune. This relates to the environment as people primarily derive their conceptions and actions towards the environment. The stereotype portrayed in the article is the reliance of Filipinos on the environment and natural resources to sustain themselves. The program that we have chosen is the Energy FM 106.7 radio program. Sinubok ng buhay at sumubok ng sumubok. The component in the program depends on the products derived from the environment and natural resources to use in business. The stereotype portrayed is that failure and sadness are signs of weaknesses. The chosen movie is The Eternals from Marvel. It tackles immortal godlike beings that were meant to protect the earth and the people. The components use the natural resources to serve as their food, clothing, and shelter. They evolved utilizing the resources and persisted with encountering problems with the environment. The TV commercial that was chosen is the heartwarming choking TV commercial. It portrays Filipino cultures and values during special occasions. The environment was depicted through forest products used as furniture and other home materials. The poster attracts the attention of OFWs in Japan that they could send yen to the Philippines using their services. For Type B, LBC creates a network among OFWs that would consistently use their services to send money back home. Type C, LBC could cause inconvenience and uncertainty for first-time users of the service because of the next-day door-to-door delivery if the money is not delivered to the right person or the promise of the next-day delivery is not met. Failed deliveries consume a lot of gas that can contribute to carbon emissions. The poster promotes the receiver of yen to hold the money and wait for a higher exchange rate at the money exchange centers. The downside of holding paper money is that the finance department of countries would print more currency to suffice the circulation of money. It will need a lot of paper and other natural resources to print more currency. The poster that we have chosen is Tide Detergent, which is designed for heavy-duty machine cleaning. The stereotype portrayed is that women are strongly associated with domestic chores such as doing laundry. In relation to the environment, the usage of this detergent, which contains chemicals, are highly toxic to aquatic life and ecosystems. They also use plastic packaging, which contributes to pollution and the death of marine habitats through improper waste disposal. The article chosen is entitled Dr. Taylor Swift's Seven Inspiring Lessons from the Pop Star's Commencement Speech published by Phil Starr. Although there is no environmental component from her speech, the environmental link is observed in how she recounts the challenge of the pandemic and how this halted the lives of everyone, most of all students, and the academe's overarching struggle for maintaining quality education given the remote learning setup. The radio program we've chosen is Dear MOR's Friend Zone, which uncovers the possibility of friendship of opposite sex not having a romantic relationship. Although the program has no environmental elements, there are some minor environmental connections such as characters being exposed to air pollution caused by gases released by factories and the combustion of fossil fuels by vehicles. This movie shows a very typical Filipino stereotype that features a prominent social problem. First, the plight of Filipino workers abroad. Second, a single mother who juggles raising kids and working for working to provide for them, and the, lastly, the misogynist idea of parenting. In terms of human environment aspect of the film, although very brief, the movie was able to give a glimpse of the environment in which the family belongs, a typical urban environment where it is devoid based on what is, what is on portrayed any, of any natural features. The film Anak has four media effects. The first is Type A, which draws off W's to see the film because of their personal connections to it. 
Type B inspired viewers to be more respectful of OFWs. When the film displays the eldest child's rebellious behavior, the Type C media effect develops as viewers could be influenced. Finally, the Type D media effect in which the film shapes people's minds to think that working overseas is reasonable and acceptable rather than seeing our nation as an impoverished society that relies on slave labor. The commercial that we have chosen was the one from the KFC. This commercial highlighted the people-environment interaction by showing how the behaviors, routines, and activities of the Philippines changed after the drastic changes in environment due to the pandemic. It also encourages the general public that the pandemic could not hold them down in pursuing what they want. Hence, the hashtag KFC is the day. Good evening, everyone. Here is Group 3's examination of the media portrayal of environment and natural resources. The Liga Sardines print ad conveys a general message to spread awareness and even the fear appeal on identifying COVID-19 symptoms. Its meme-like manner of presentation projects its message of lightening the mood while providing general reminders for our health. The environment as depicted in this print ad is one wherein we should be cautious about. The purpose of this article is to address the media to be responsible for what they publish. Some media companies are tagged to be biased when they publish articles that criticize big companies, popular peoples, or the government, which resulted for the media to continuously look for an avenue to publish credible news, and these are through online platforms. Monster RX 93.1% TMR. The Morning Rush! The Morning Rush! The Morning Rush talks about people's coping mechanisms when going through a tough time. They mentioned the importance of one's environment in dealing with your problems and mentioned how the environment helps calm us and our thoughts. This interaction of people with the environment helps in making people feel better. Ayo ay mga sundalo na puno ng pag-ibig. Hindi nang galit. Matatag ang posisyon natin. Excerpt of the film Goyo, Ang Batang General. Soldiers and Filipinos alike are called to fight all of our battles, including our fight for a better environment, not with hatred at heart, but with love for our country and our fellow countrymen. The environment is depicted here as our stronghold and only refuge amidst crisis. We owe it to future generations to safeguard the environment in the same valiant manner heroes defended our independence. The environmental movement, like the conflicts that Goyo and his camp waged, ought not to be fought with hate, but rather with love for the nation and for our fellow men and women to protect our best interests. Kuya Jay Restaurant TV commercial reflects the role of humans and their indivisible relationship to nature despite conflicts and changes happening over time. As shown in the advertisement, the strong bond within the family represented by the siblings depicts the genuine love that nourishes their relations. Likewise, this genuine love that a family had is applicable to how we treat the environment because we humans are highly dependent on nature. We are tasked to serve as stewards of the environment and in return, nature provides our needs to sustain our lives. For the Type A short-term intended, Kuya J's TV commercial appealed to the emotions of the viewers and inserted all of their specialty foods to promote their product. Type B long-term intended, the long-term intention of Kuya J's commercial is to solidify the brand as a go-to restaurant, a place to go with family for food trips that are affordable and Filipino, and having that brotherly figure. Kuya J TV commercial in relation to short-term unintended was demonstrates the bond of two brothers through road trips with beautiful terrain and beauty. While for the long-term unintended, the commercial unintentionally shows the stereotypical way men go through the grief of a loved one. In the case of Kuya J's commercial, it appealed to the emotions through subtle hints of the loss of their father. The main point of the poster is to let the audience have a break from their stressful environment, which makes it the people-environment interaction. As per the stereotype of the advertisement, it used people assigned colors, in this case, the color red, to give emphasis to the message of the poster itself. This further challenges how an advertisement would turn out to be without a direct label component. The article discussed the important role of hybrid working conditions in the Philippines and the needed infrastructure investment to further support the alternative work arrangement in the country. It challenged the stereotype that all work should be on-site since people from companies have been happier and more productive since working from home. 93.9 IFM Diary was selected for the radio drama and stereotype portrayed are when money or wealth should be the deciding factor in choosing a partner in life. Meanwhile, the stereotype of women expected to settle with a man rather than choosing their career and self-growth was challenged. The main character chose herself by going back to school to finish her degree despite her adult age and build a name for herself instead of settling either the two of her suitors. 
School service follows the story of Maya, a young girl taken against her will from the province and placed as a beggar in Manila by a small-time syndicate. It is an indie film directed by Louis Ignacio with Ayay de las Alas as the star, and the film mainly features the life of street children in Manila, which challenges the stereotype on social class and child labor. Bonchon All New Season is a commercial that was released in September of 2019 as a way of promoting the honey citrus Korean style chicken. Situated in a romantic comedy genre, it has underlying gender stereotypes which oversimplifies the idea of certain individuals based on his or her gender. Solving stereotypes, especially in TV commercials, need to be fixed from a perspective behind the camera as much as what is being shown and aired. In terms of media effect, Bonchon's commercial gives us, the audience instant craving for a short-term deliberate effect, selling Bonchon as go to fast food for a long-term deliberate effect, linking people to nature through picnics for short-term unintended effect, and choosing not to help people over self-interest for long-term unintended effect. Thank you. Congratulations to all of us for effectively analyzing the representation of the environment and natural resources in the different types of media prevailing in our society today. And I'm sure our audience learned a lot from those presentations. Good job, everyone. Good job, everyone. And imagine we have reached the middle of our program. Is everyone doing great? Show us your reactions by using the reactions here in Zoom or by chatting in the comments section. We're grateful to be here with you tonight. All right. We hope everyone is having a great time. Again, please leave a comment down below if you have any questions or concerns. Oh, yeah. Almost forgot about that. And thanks for the timely reminder, DK. Now, the next presentation will tackle demography and natural resources. Here, students will be presenting the population pyramids of different countries and the relationship between the people and society of the chosen countries to their economy and environment. We're about to delve into yet another relevant topic, so eyes on the screen, everyone. We are the members of Group 1 and we will be reporting about the population dynamics and resource use of Angola, China, Belgium, Qatar, and Greece. In Angola, males and females almost have the same number. Majority of the country's population is composed of very young individuals. This resulted in a large decrease in the economic growth rate from 0.9% in year 2015 to negative 2.5% in year 2017. High birth rate and population pressures resulted in soil erosion, overuse of pasture, low quality water, and adequate supplies of potable water. Lastly, high international demand for timber and fuel resulted in deforestation. China's population is a good indicator of economic development with the GDP as of 2020 is mostly influenced by services industry and agricultural sector. China is the world's number one emitter of carbon dioxide. People who are dependent on natural resources and with the growing industry and other sectors mentioned, various altercations have been made that negatively affected the environment and natural resources. Belgium's population pyramid exhibits low to moderate population growth. The country has fully adopted to the consequences of industrialization wherein women are empowered. This has a positive effect on the economy's GDP that ranked 31st in the world. However, as a highly industrialized country, they suffer from water pollution. In Qatar, there are more males than females. The increase in population resulted in the decrease of economic growth rate from 3.7% in year 2015 to 1.6% in year 2017. The country is suffering from air, water, land pollution that resulted in limited natural freshwater resources. They export large amount of natural gas and petroleum that calls for the conservation of their oil supplies. There is also an overconsumption of forest and natural resources. Greece has almost an equal population of males and females where most belong to the working age group. This has rendered a positive effect on the country's GDP. However, due to the pandemic, the GDP of the country has decreased from 2019 to 2020. Other than that, the country is also experiencing environmental crisis including air and water pollution. 
Lastly, the country also lacks environmental policies and has limited environmental law enforcement. The population pyramid of Australia shows a progressive development coming from its working sector. With a population growth rate of 1.25%, the GDP in the country increased by 0.32% from 2017 to 2018. This implies that the country's population is proportionate to economic growth. The most common in environmental problem is soil erosion and salinity, water shortage, and deforestation. The population pyramid of Canada shows its aging population which continues to shape their society and economy. With an over 38 million population, more people are retiring than entering the workforce. Although immigration drove their population growth, the consequences associated with low birth rate cannot be overcome through it. The deforestation rate is among the lowest in the world. However, the most common environmental problem is pollution due to high rate of urbanization and the three largest industries. Ecuador's population pyramid is contracting, indicating that people aged 25 to 54 are the main contributors to the country's declining development. The GDP of the country fell from 2.37 to 0.06% in 2019. This means that the country's population growth is in keeping pace with economic growth. Deforestation, soil erosion, desertification, and pollution are the most common environmental issues of the country. TB has a population of around 7 million people with 41% of them aged 25 to 54. Fertility is the most significant factor in population increase. Libya's urban population is also fast rising, accounting for 81% of the country's total population and growing at a rate at 1.45% each year. As a result, the certification and lack of natural fresh water supplies, water pollution, and the combined effects of sewage, all by products, and industrial waste will all worsen. Pakistan's population pyramid shows a progressive development coming from the youth sector. With a population growth rate of 1.95%, the GDP in the country increased from 4.6% in 2016 to 5.4% in 2017. This implies that the country's population is proportionate to its economic growth. The most common environmental problem is water pollution, deforestation, and soil erosion. Population dynamics and resource use we use the data gathered from the CIA.org, specifically that of the current for population and population growth rate, in determining when will the population will over-exploit, at least in this case, their forest resources. This was done by applying economic principles to the data given with that of each country's respective current forest cover and current deforestation rate. We were able to see that most of the country will reach the maximum capacity of their forest resource resources as early as 2030. The total population of Saudi Arabia stands at 35.84 million. The population density is at 16.67 people per square kilometer and the median age is 32.4 years. Saudi Arabia is remarkable in terms of their mortality rates and life expectancy at birth, but despite this, there are still issues of unemployment within Saudi Arabia's nationals, which are more than double. Taiwan's economy is driven largely by industrial manufacturing, exports of electronics, machinery, and petrochemicals, resulting to major environmental issues with water pollution, contamination of the supply of drinking water, and issues with low level of radioactive waste disposal. The total fertility rate in the country is among the lowest in the world, raising the prospect of future labor shortages, falling domestic demand, and declining tax revenue. New Zealand's industrialized and free market economy kept inflation below 2%. With that, the unemployment rate has remained around 4%. However, urban areas housed 86.7% of New Zealand's total population, which can degrade air and water quality, water availability, waste disposal, and energy consumption. The Yemen population is comprised of about 30.9 million individuals. Its population density was about 59.0 people per square kilometer, and the median age is 20.2 years. The country was notable for its declined economy due to the 8% jobless rate coming from 40 to 54 years old, who are expected to be employed, but due to the land contamination brought by large-scale cultivation and production of oils, population below poverty line had increased. As reflected by its population pyramid, majority of the population of Venezuela belongs to the working group. Despite this, statistics showed that 33.1% of the people are below the poverty line. Amidst an economic crisis and increasing vulnerability of its population, Venezuela continues to face a de-escalation of natural resources due to pollution and irresponsible resource extraction.
Kenya is a country that has a decreasing inflation rate as years pass by. It has also a rich labor force with 1.5 million population in 2017 and the majority of the labor force was done for services. It has an unemployment rate of 18.9% as of 2017. It could be concluded that poverty is present in the country for it has a population below the poverty line with 26.4%. At the same time, their public debt is 53.5% of the GDP. We are Group 4 and we will be presenting AR7, Population Dynamics and Resource Use of Certain Countries such as Japan, Spain, Nepal, Ireland, and Nigeria. Japan's population pyramid shows that almost 50% of their population is in working age between 25 to 64 years old. And majority of that working population are accounted for service works and highest GDP per sector. From 1968 to 2010, Japan's economy was the world's second largest and its GDP was predicted to be 5.2 trillion in 2019. The population pyramid of Spain shows that 43.61% of the population is between 25 to 54 years old. It means that almost half of the country's population are of working age, which contribute greatly to the economic condition of the country as the state GDP is highly dependent on the active employment of its citizens. In addition, Spain is also one of the most populated countries in Europe and they contribute a significant percentage of carbon emissions in Europe. The population pyramid of Nepal shows that majority of its population are in the working age group and one-fourth of its population are living below the poverty line. It shows why Nepal is one of the least developed countries in the world and their economic mainstay is agriculture. It only accounts for less than a third of their GDP. Since most of them are into agriculture, Agriculture. agriculture land is higher than forest and deforestation is one of their environmental problems. The population pyramid of Ireland shows that a large chunk of the population is composed of middle-aged people from 25 to 54 years old. With a labor force of almost 2.2 million, the main driver of Ireland's economy is to its services sector, which constitutes 60% of the gross domestic product and supported by robust job growth strong export sector and a low inflation rate. The growing population has affected the usage of natural resources as well as their status in life in Nigeria despite their diversification in eco economic gain. Their oil industry being their main source of economic growth has only contributed 1.5% to the world's GDP as of 2021. What a night full of learning it is. Tonight is really hellfire. I hope our audience learned as much as we did. Right, Alvin? Indeed. Thank you very much, SFFG 152 Section T, for sharing all those analyses. It paved the way for us to better understand the dynamics of our society, economy, and environment. Yes, 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 that's right. And because we would like to take advantage of this overflowing interest to learn, we will now move forward to the AR8 presentation. What? AR8? Why are you suddenly speaking in codes here, DK? Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to. But for everyone's information, all these presentations are class outputs which are referred to in the SFFG152 class as ARs or activity responses. What I was referred to earlier as AR8 or activity response aid is entitled Valuing the Contribution of Women in Natural Resources Conservation. And thank you so much for the clarification, DK. I was afraid our audience would feel out of place after hearing it without context. Anyways, ARA tackles gender in the context of environment and natural resources. Here we will present different tribes from all around the globe and show how men and women differ in roles according to their respective culture. Without further ado, here are the presentations for ARA. Bajau means man of the seas and they are an indigenous ethnic group of the Philippines. They are known as the sea gypsies because they move with the wind and the tide on their small houseboats called vintas. They can be found in many coastal settlements and inhabit the waters and shores of Sulu archipelago. However, they are one of the most obscure, misunderstood, and marginalized ethnic groups in the country nowadays. 
The Bajau tribe is reliant on marine resources. The Sulusi had an abundance of fish that helped to sustain their livelihood. Most of the daily catch was bartered with other tribes that live along the shores and beaches. Many Bajaus that remain living on the east coast retain their seaborne lifestyle, particularly their traditional attire called Patajong. The size is large enough to fit any type of person. Both men and women use this piece of clothing as a skirt or tucked as a gown. The men in the tribe are skilled fishermen. They specialize in the art of pantana fishing or spare fishing. They are also talented divers for collecting pearls. Bajau men use the patajong as their skirt, head cover, waistband, sash, or hood. Bajau women are usually assigned at doing household chores such as cooking and taking care of their children. They are skilled in terms of weaving and even excel in embroidery. However, their culture and tradition influence them to marry at an early age which impose maternal comfort that is also due to lack of knowledge and of maturity. Analyzing the roles and responsibilities of men and women is crucial for sustainable natural resource management. They both hold gender differentiated interests in natural resource management through their distinctive roles, responsibilities, and knowledge. Also, promoting gender equality and women empowerment in natural resource management creates sustainable benefits both for the community and the environment. A pleasant day to everyone. This is to introduce to you the topic of Women, the Environment and Natural Resources, Activity Response 8, the Tiboli Tribe from South Cotabato. Tiboli Tribe is famous for being the most creative and artistic ethno-linguistic group in the province of Southern Cotabato. The men and women of the Tiboli Tribe play a significant role in the conservation of natural resources. Both men and women of the Tiboli tribe provide a responsive and empowered management practice toward the conservation and sustainable utilization of the Ala Valley Watershed Forest Reserve. Furthermore, the tribe considers natural resources sacred because they believe that these materials contain spirits. Roles of Tiboli Women Tiboli women are tied and defined by their responsibilities to their families, communities, and husbands. Their age influences how much effort they should put into their job. In their culture, elder women, regardless of gender, have more power over the younger members of the household. Tiboli women's responsibilities in agriculture support those of the Tiboli men. They are also known for their famous Tinalak weaving, which uses non-forest timber products. Their roles are considered to be Teimegal, which translates as extremely tough in comparison to men's roles. They are currently actively engaged in the production and sale of their own product. In terms of clothing, Tibali women often wear a tight-fitting, long-sleeved colorless shirt in plain black or navy blue as presented on the screen. The women in the images are wearing tubao, a headdress used while women work in the sun. Roles of Tibali Men Tibali men are commonly leaders, family heads, and tribe headmen. They are mostly in charge of decision-making in the house, as well as how the resources they have will be distributed and utilized. They are in charge of agricultural work, ensuring the sustainability of these resources in order to produce food and income for the community. For the Tiboli men clothing, Tiboli men no longer wear their traditional attire. They now wear typical pants and skirts and always carry ceremonial swords. Good evening, fellow Filipinos. Today, we are going to talk about the indigenous peoples of the Mindoro Island, who are collectively known as the Mangyans. According to the Mangyan Heritage Center, eight different cultural communities comprise the Mangyans of Mindoro. Among these eight, we'll be specifically talking about the Buhid Mangyans. Buhid came from the Mangyan word Sambuhid, which means mountains. Buhid Mangyans are known to be skilled pot makers, farmers, basket weavers, and hunters. Buhid women wear linagmon, a woven black and white undergarment, and an abol, which is a black and white skirt. Buhid men, on the other hand, wear G-strings. Ornamentations in the form of belts, or lufas, earrings, bracelets or upsong, headband or sambao, and necklaces, locally known as siwayang or ugot, may be used by both genders to enhance body beauty. These ornamentations are more evident for unmarried men and women. 
It is important to note that both sexes use an accessory bag called bayong that they can use to store personal things and or tools. For women, it would be comb, thread, or beads, as they are usually the accessory makers, weavers, and homemakers. For men, the bayong would be used to keep a knife, trowel, and seeds that they can use for sweden farming, gathering of other forest products, and hunting. While mangyans remain to be usual communities where men are assigned with productive roles and women with reproductive ones, activities such as farming, decision-making, and community leadership are shared by both genders. Additionally, women are also the ones responsible for selling their produce. We hope you saw how both genders are equally important for natural resource utilization and conservation activities of the mangyans. Thank you for listening. Good day, we are Group 4, and today we will be presenting our activity response on valuing the contribution of women in natural resource conservation. The Torahans are an ethnic group indigenous to the mountainous region of South Sulawesi, Indonesia. Torahan came from the Buginese term Toraiha, or people of the uplands. The Torahans were highland rice cultivators, but also participated in timber harvesting and other agroforestry practices. The Torahans divided the roles of men and women in natural resource conservation and utilization the traditional way. The Torahan men's role highly focused on timber production, either from forest or private lands, and men worked in the field from the morning and the afternoon. The Tarahan women's work focused more on the agroforestry and horticultural practices. In terms of the non-timber forest products, such as rattan and fuel wood, it is predominantly a man's work, but women are also involved. In terms of NDFPs, women are more involved in mushroom and wild fruit collection. The women's role was highly due to their responsibility to fulfill the food needs of their family. Women woke up early in the morning, prepared food for all the family members, and took care of the children before they went to school. In nursery work, women's responsibility was to fill the poly bags with soil and seed. A few women also had the responsibility for seed selection, but men had the roles in selecting high-quality seed. While men hold the soil to prepare the planting poles, women usually had the responsibility for planting, placing the poly bag in the hole, pouring the water, and planting new vegetation. Torahan women's role in natural resource management is focused towards providing food for their families through agroforestry practices. The sustainable utilization of these products, as, we, as well as the assistance in timber harvesting practices, assures the contribution of the Torahan women in natural resource management. The Aka tribe is also known as Hani in Chinese. They commonly in mountainous areas. This community is chosen to demonstrate a disparity that breaks the traditional patriarchal social system. The men and women of the tribe contribute to the conservation of natural resources by being involved in ethnic tourism. The Aka women are said to generate more income and have more opportunities compared to men. The occupations of the men in tribe are souvenir wholesaling and tour operations. However, they must meet several criteria, including having a good educational background. They also work in the local lakes and streams and often play as the head of the household. Their roles are to solve difficult problems and look after the safety of their environment. Akha men usually wear simple clothes different from the one portrayed. Aka men commonly wear white vests, blue jackets, and loose trousers. They sometimes wear headdresses for important occasions like weddings. Women of the tribe are often assigned to souvenir vending, waiting tables, and other service industries. Most opportunities are given to women in the name of exoticism. They often gather plants from the forest, eggs, and insects for medicinal purposes. 
They also carry out tasks in the household. Aka women are considered to be feminine. They wear dresses with silver coins, buttons, and beads for preparation for potential marriage. The headdresses is the reflection of their identity as it indicates that a woman is graceful. Our group presents you the Rungus tribe. This tribe is located in the tropical jungles of Sabah in the Malaysian area in the part of Borneo Island. Their tribe is known for long houses to which the Rungus men participate in building. They rely mostly on agriculture, specifically rice cultivation, as well as other crops. For the Rungus men's attire, the cover on the head is called siga, the neck accessory is called tingot. The black blouse with traditional prints is called badu. The trouser is called masa. They have waist accessories called sandai and hokoi. And the shoulder bonds diagonally placed from shoulders to hip area is called pinakol. It shows the spur hunting of a man. Overall, this attire is what Rumus men wear when performing ceremonies and substantial activities in the field. For the Rumus women's attire, the headband is called sisingat. The disc necklace is called gangaloon. Similar to men's attire, they have shoulder bands called pinakol. The hip band is called orot, and the nilan sarong is tapi rinogadi. Rungus women wear dark belts with delicate hands-on patterns matching nilan pencil skirts and skirts that fall on the arms like sleeves. Rungus women are well known for their skills in weaving as well as their intricate beadworks. The upper part of the body is decorated with horizontal stripes with embroidery motifs. The lower part is decorated with vertical straps. In modern times, only festivals and rituals call for this attire, complete with all the beads and belts. Both sexes participate in activities necessary for the community. Their gender roles are perceived as behaviorally and ideologically equal to the community. In the context of production, both men and women do their tasks to varying degrees. Husband and wife are expected to meet timbang or balance each other. The balance of roles is depicted on how the term for husband and wife is only one, which they call savo. Men tend the Swedens and women maintain them. Both men and women plant, weed, and harvest. Men care for and raise dogs and water buffalo. Women care for pigs and chickens. Men hunt for large bushmeats, catch fish, and gather honey while women gather snails and shellfish and collect wild roots, nuts, berries, and vegetables. Overall, the roles of men and women are intertwined and constitute a whole in the concept of balance. Hello, everyone. I am Arvin Catalia, and I will be representing our group as the narrator for this presentation. For our journal article, we chose conservation perceptions, common property, and cultural popularization among the Marani of Ecuador's Amazon by Flora Lu and Kiara Worth. The Warani, also known as the Huwarani, Wa, Wadani, or Aukas, is a tribe located in the eastern lowland tropical forest of Ecuador. We chose this tribe and journal article due to the fact that the men and women of the Warani have begun to see the effects of continuous damage dealt by outsiders to their surrounding environment, and they are taking steps to now remedy this, starting with delineating and mapping their territory and even planning for ecotourism. Generally speaking, indigenous tribes recognize male and female genders, but they do not categorize roles by the sex of an individual. The Warani tribe in particular prizes the capacity for hard work in both hunting and gathering regardless of sex. Adults are expected to be autonomous, independent, self-reliant, sexually vibrant, and physically strong and capable. Warani men were generally hunters, warriors, and killers, while women were gardeners and caretakers of infants. However, men also felled trees for garden plots and sometimes harvested cassava and other such products. Women hunted when the opportunity presented itself and often accompanied men on long hunting expeditions. Both sexes fish and gather forest products 
as well as take care of the children and teach them subsistence activities. Thus, while there is a presence of typical gender roles, it is flexible and not overly restrictive. The Warani culture can be characterized as one that is extremely individualistic and independent, with no authority beyond individuals' powers of persuasion and coercion. This extended to all facets of their culture, and this included decision-making, conflict resolution, social organization, and of course, natural resource conservation and management. That is all for our presentation, and thank you for listening. The Roles of Kalamuyan Tribe in Conservation of Natural Resources Kalamuyan Tribe are mostly resides in the mountainous areas of northern Luzon. They are considered a subgroup of Ifugao that is commonly seen in the parts of Pangasinan, Benguet, and Ifugao. They are considered one of the distinctive ethnic groups in the Philippines due to their notable language, customs, and traditions. The lives of the Kalamuyans are dependent on their environment. Due to the environment they had, Kalamuyans are considered to be a kaingineros, which involves their Sweden farming activities. They suit was designated for particular activities they did. For Kalamuyan women's suits, women are known for their woven striped skirts or lakba, which are made up of flaps of different colors combination around their waists partnered with their blouse made from the same materials. They use baskets or kayabang to carry their farming tools. They also wear brass coiled bracelets or necklaces, also known as gading or bat. For Kalamuyan men suits, men are known for their striped G-strings, also known as kuban, partnered in sleeveless vests and carry backpacks or akbot made out of deer hide and bolo for hunting and harvesting purposes. The roles of Kalamuyan men and women are obviously different. Women were relegated to the private sphere of the home. They are left in the house to do housekeeping, childcare, and helpful physical life. They are also assigned to the farm during the planting and harvesting period. On the other hand, Men were assigned public roles and other heavy activities such as hunting and plowing. In addition, men have the right to education. However, men and women are seen as important in their farming activities, particularly when harvest time approaches. As time goes on, education for women had seen significance due to the training that involved women, until it turns out that women are mostly interested in education than men because men are supposedly highly interested in farming activities. Now that we have seen the majority of presentations, I feel nothing but pride for our class. We have endured and successfully delivered all these important activities not only for ourselves, but for the benefit of the entire society, especially that of our audience for tonight. True, very deserved, and I really totally agree with that. And I hope our audience learned a lot tonight. And also, let us continue to enjoy the pride as we are the pride we are feeling right now as we listen to different application of Dr. Gara's Ten Cup or theory of engaged collaboration across borders to natural resource governance in our chosen communities. Onwards to AR9. Natural resource governance are the norms, institutions, and procedures that determine how power and responsibilities over natural resources are exercised, how choices are made, and how citizens engage in and profit from natural resource management. The goal of TENCAP is to describe how a local environmental campaign in a third world settings involves into a worldwide advocacy network. Applying the theory of engaged collaboration of borders or TENCAB to the project concerning the mangrove areas of Quezon province, our group came up with this modified framework, which situated the local, national, and international actors surrounding the advocacy of carbon sequestration and mangrove forest rehabilitation. 
At the national level, the organizations involved are the DNR with other government agencies, private and business sectors, the Team Energy Foundation Incorporate, other NGOs, people organizations, and the local communities of Padre Burgos and Pagbilao in Quezon Province. The DNR serves as the primary agent of the state tasked to advance research and development in the community. On the other hand, the private and business sectors provide budgetary support and resources for the project. The Team Energy Foundation Incorporated offers services and rehabilitation activities that ensure the community's empowerment and natural disaster resilience. Hence, together with the continuously engaged collaboration of NGOs with local communities and funding from private and business sectors, the project's operational success will be viable. The framework provides a strong foundation in outlining the definitive role of key players all with the, with the goal of a collaborative and engaged cooperation. At the top of the framework, posits the broad agencies of national and international organizations connected by, as, a, as the framework implies, through bilateral cooperation and information sharing respectively. Through this cooperation, the shared ideas between international actors are forged through formal international agreements such as the Conference of Paris and the Paris Agreement. Through the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, the Team Energy Incorporated, along with other NGOs and research institutions, as well as the local communities of Padre Burgos and Pagbilao, shares information and collaborate with international NGOs. Then, the international NGOs lobby for their objectives to these international agreements that will be adapted at the local level setting. The concept of natural resources governance focuses on how power and responsibilities influence the utilization of natural resources and how people participate, make decisions, and benefit in the management of natural resources. However, it has been observed in the Philippines how locals are being downplayed and excluded in the decision-making process. The theory of engaged collaboration across borders or TENCAB was applied to the natural resource governance in the case of the construction of the Pasig Expressway. It elaborates how the local environmental campaigns in third world countries evolved into a transnational advocacy networks. The concept of local NGOs collaborating with external NGOs across borders is the focus of this concept. Shown in the slide is the Parex framework based on TENCAB. The construction of the Parex would cause a wide array of negative impacts on the environment, traffic system, social sector, and heritage sites. The main stakeholders affected are the local communities in the project sites, which include 97 barangays and thousands of informal settlers and households. This illustrates how various NGOs make efforts to persuade and protest activities concerning the construction of the multi-billion parex, hence an engaged collaboration between local communities, local NGOs, and international NGOs would be of great significance in putting pressure on the government to ensure that sustainable development and the welfare of the people are prioritized, making this advocacy a transnational one. International organizations will also persuade foreign governments to take interest in bilateral collaboration between them and the Philippine government to discuss how sustainable development can be achieved in roads and infrastructural developments without the negative impacts outweighing the positive benefits of the said development. The collective persuasion and protest from local and international NGOs would put pressure on DNR to revisit the project and take actions. Strong adherence of the DNR to its mandate will be encouraged as they would enforce laws, regulate policies, strictly monitor and provide inputs and recommendations to the San Miguel Corporation, the proponent of Parex. This would help in mitigating risks and negative impacts of the project development and will put pressure to SMC to consult and communicate with the local communities. Thank you. Wow, we have seen all of it already, everyone. And with that, let us give SFFG 152 Section T a well-deserved, resounding virtual round of applause. And classmates, because we are not physically together right now to congratulate each other, please go ahead and give yourselves a well-deserved pat on the back for a job well done. And to our audience, thank you very, very, very much for sharing your valuable time with us and the attention that you have given us. This will not be possible without all of you. Special thanks to our professors, family, and friends who watched us tonight. We are truly grateful for your presence.
And once again, we are SFFG152 Section T, and this has been Tomat Flayers, Mind Flayers of Forest, of Forest Sociology. Sociology. We do hope you enjoy the stay in our own world of the Upside Down with no monsters, but more learning. Mabuhay ang mga iskolar ng bayan para sa bayan. Mabuhay. I hope you enjoyed watching the video. Please don't forget to subscribe, like and comment, and ring the notification bell. I'll see you in the next video. Bye!